edition of the Richmond Java Users Group. Roman is our social chair. Barry, who's around here somewhere, there he is, is our host. So thank you for the signage and all. And uh, Gerardo Navarros, did I say right? Yeah. Is speaking on Spring Boot tonight. So that'll be good for me. I'll, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then our sponsors tonight are um, Signature. So thanks for all the food, guys. Dave, would you like to go up and yeah, say sure. anything about the company? Sure. Services, etc. We're a uh, we're a staffing firm here in Richmond. We've been here since 2006. Um, I've been with Signature for about seven years, almost now. Uh, we've been in business since '97, based out of Fort Lauderdale. Um, we're nationwide. And uh, I mean, we we're, we're a stop. Pretty much, we work with our clients to really fill contract spots for them on contract, contract to hire, and direct placement basis. Um, we don't do a lot of statement of work stuff, but uh, we've got a really good client base here. We've been here for a while. We really build our our brand based upon getting to know our consultants, getting to know our clients. Um, that high touch, not high volume business so uh, we're, we're very happy to be here um, to learn more about uh, the topic tonight and if you haven't gotten a raffle ticket please come get one we have car chargers and we're going to be raffling off to uh, Google, Google Chromecast and uh, uh, HD Fire 7 or Fire HD 7 and um, happy to be here thank you for having us So for the, those of you who haven't been with us before, um, after the speaker, we'll have a raffle. And, um, and then we all, a bunch of us will want to converge over on at Toast at the Village Shopping Center. Uh, everybody's welcome to join us. Uh, next month, we've got Emmanuel Garduno speaking on Java RX. Um, Anyway, Gerardo is a software engineer with Dominion Voltage, and you want to take it away? Yep. Thank you. Come there. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here at the art job. It's uh, always a nice gathering. Folks are really nice to learn new things. So it's pretty exciting to be here, speaking a little bit about Spring Boot. Uh, I call it a securing ideas from scratch. Uh, you will see why in a moment, but it's, it basically has to do to Spring Boot being a relatively new project that came out a little bit, I think, probably March of this year. So by now it's already going version 2, release candidate 1 is already out there. So it's going to be a, an interesting, interesting development. Okay, what's on our agenda tonight? A little bit reminder of the great religious wars between J2E and Spring, and a reminder of why, of why are we here with the Spring Boot tonight. A uh, little bit of talk about convention versus configuration with regard to our framework. How uh, Spring Boot fits into the picture, uh, the different models that are provided, uh, external license configuration, a little bit of why Spring Boot is an important framework, or is becoming an important framework <coughs> in terms of microservices and the Internet of Things. We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, all problems, new solutions. Uh, we're so we we're going to mention microservices there. We've been there before. I'm going to talk a bit about it and what are the solutions or how are we going, are we, are we trying to work with services or with microservices today? And a demo, hopefully. I think it was working right or what I did. Okay. J2EE, for now it's just J2E, I think. If anyone is here has experience of working with EJB 2.0, uh, I'm really sorry for you. <laughs> uh, 
I was able to avoid it just in time, uh, but, but it wasn't fun. I mean, if, if we're talking about verbose configuration and having to do a lot of boilerplate code, or just a simple hello world, that was the very definition of what EJB2 was. And then came Spring Framework. This Spring really came from a, from a book by Rob Johnson about J2E uh, design patterns. He was trying to come up with the best practices that we also try to follow to, to make enterprise applications. One of his big, uh, big points was you know, working with plain POYOs, plain Java objects, rather than having very uh, strong dependencies on, on the framework, which at the time was EJBs. Uh, but back then, well, we, we had Hibernate previous to JPA. Hibernate was one of the main uh, relational mapping tools. Uh, Spring got around a concept of plain POYOS and how to, to gather them together into an application, but at the same time was able to use services from many different providers. So I mentioned Hibernate there, but there was Ibaris, there was Castor, there was a bunch of, well, Castor was it, some was called, uh, anyway, there was a bunch of uh, relational object, relational mappings, uh, JPO was another standard, which for some reason didn't catch up, so object databases didn't work out, so. And, uh, but it, it was all configured by XML, which was kind of playful, I'll show you that in a moment. Then with Java 5 and annotations came the first Java Bean Street, and we began to have annotations that helped to uh, configure the code more easily than, than what we had in EJB 2.0. Then Spring 3, once again, embracing instead, instead of having the standard EJB and stateless annotation, for example, they had components or they had, uh, uh, I don't know, controllers for the NBC application, NBC modules, etc. And then Java Enterprise Edition 6, uh, we are in 7 now. Well, if you call it component, I'm going to, I'm going to say inject and I'm going to do, be doing the same thing with CDI and injecting dependencies and whatnot. Uh, but it was still very verbose. Uh, I did have a sample that I was working with recently, but this is what it looks like. This is a Spring Security configuration. Uh, lots of XML, mainly because we don't want any, at the moment, they don't want any configuration inside the application code. This was very verbose, very difficult to work with. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could have your development configuration, your testing configuration, etc. But once still, uh, you know, you had to do a lot of configuration to get things working, and uh, you could very easily run into issues with that. We'll go to that in a moment. And here comes visual convention versus configuration. Simple as that, but it's still cumbersome. So I show you in that slide before. Then they came new frameworks and languages, which some of them were not new, they had been around for a few years. They began to come up with new frameworks that help developers create web applications or other enterprise applications very quickly. Ruby on Rails, using Groovy. Rails using Groovy. Groovy was uh, kind of new at the moment. It was It became kind of the one of the de facto scripting languages in Java. Uh, so they will have a similar configuration in most of, in most of our applications. We need to adjust to different environments when we are developing and pushing the, product, the application to different stages, you know, development QA, uh, production, etc. Transactions. Uh, and coming up a little bit, it was kind of tricky if you forgot to set up your 
transaction management correctly, let's say so for one method, you could handle some <coughs> errors and you could recover from them. In other places, you have to be very careful with your transaction management. So it was uh, complicated trying to remember where you had to do what. Even though there was a set of best practices, that, guidelines that everyone should have been following, every new project was starting from creating the configuration from scratch. So it was easy to miss things every now and then. And then also came, you know, security configuration, uh, for example. I mean, security, and, and I like this aspect a lot from, from Spring Security, they consider, uh, they consider that an aspect of the application. It's not the main functionality. I mean, you shouldn't have to be writing any code that says, well, if the user has this and this role, then do that. You should be able to have a framework that can, you know, protect the application from any user that is not supposed to be allowed there, or that doesn't have the role to perform certain edit operations, for example. And besides that, Besides that role-based uh, application configuration, you also had to deal with different uh, environments. I mean, you have the, you have NetMinder, for example, in big enterprises. You had other folks who have, you know, Active Directory or LDAP, or they had a database with uh, passwords encrypted that were not really well encrypted, and it's getting in the news every day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it was a lot of boilerplate, boilerplate. So. They come up with this templating engines or template tools or template writers. Uh, one of the first was a fuse made by a guy called Matt Rabel, I think. He, he basically took a bunch of things together. He said, well, I'm going to use Hibernate and Spring and, I don't know, he had a version with the struts and, with the struts and another with the Spring MVC for, for the web presentation layer. Et cetera, et cetera. So they, they were two or three options on how to configure your application. And you had a template, you had the skeleton of the application that you were going to work with. And Spring came up with their own template tool, Spring Group, which had a lot of recipes and was a bit more configurable at the moment you, you wrote the template. But in the end, it was still writing all those configuration files. And you can still mess around with them and break them. So we gained some. We got some template that we can start to work with. But uh, you know, one of and any developer who was messing with the configuration could easily break it down at the end. And uh, we come to Spring Boot. I don't know why they use that logo. Uh, this is, well, the Spring Framework came through a lot of <laughs> different owners. First, it was just Rod Johnson and the small team of guys, then they created Spring Source, then they were bought by VMware, and then VMware spun off another company called Pivotal, that has a Spring and a bunch of other projects for enterprise development and enterprise applications. And they rebranded the framework, the Spring I.O. Well, everything is I.O. right now, right? Docker I.O., et cetera. So <laughs> even this presentation tool is slide.es, which I wonder what the people in Spain think about it. Right? And uh, it relies very heavily on dependency management. Um, Gone are the days where we were downloading, I, I remember, Spring 203 dash with dependencies.zip. It was a huge file. And there was another file without the dependencies, without all the libraries that you needed, and it was, I don't know, a few megabytes. So anyone who has worked in a project that doesn't use, I mean, probably Ant or some build to <coughs> is a given, but if if you don't manage your dependencies, if, if you don't bring, you don't have for if your own repository where you're, uh, you know, pulling out the artifacts of, of 
the, the code that you are creating for the different applications, uh, it's a world of, of pain. Yes, and it's a building tool. IB uh, came up later from the people who didn't want to use Maven, and I can relate to that because we're trying to avoid their voice of XML, Maven is really not the answer. Um, so, well, Spring Boot can work with Maven, can work with Ivy, and can, work, can work with Gradle, which is what I'm going to be using today. It's a uh, domain-specific language based on, on Ruby, specific for building tools. And, and they have the concept of the starter projects. And, and that basically relies on the dependencies that you bring. For example, you can write a Spring Boot application that only uses a JDBC data source and writes to a database. No JPA, no wave, no nothing. And you can have an application that can connect to JPA or other NoSQL databases like MongoDB, Redis, and uh, I don't remember my memory any of the other ones that they support Elastic, Read, I think. Uh, or you can add uh, the web starter project or the web starter dependency, and you can have REST services, MVC applications with velocity or time leave. You can use JSPs if you want, you don't have to, thankfully. Uh, and if you use JSPs, I guess you can place uh, faces in there, but I don't know what would you do with that. But anyway, you can use messaging uh, or if it has support for the entire Spring integration framework, which is their response to Mule and uh, Active Mix and these tools that try to combine a, an ESB framework inside inside the project. It's not a full solution like uh, Oracle Fusion. Uh, I, I, I don't remember the name right now, but. It, it's not an integrated graphical tool when you can draw the relations in the diagrams with the defendant, etc. But, but you can integrate with basically anything else. You can add a Spring security or you can leave it out. And if you add it, by default, for web applications, for example, it sets up a basic authentication with a user and password that you embed in your application. That works for many services. That you're gonna just leave the standalone in one place, you know, gathering the gathering information. If you need to integrate with the enterprise Active Directory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you can override the configuration and deal with all of that yourself. Uh, social, well, they have they can take feeds from Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc., et and all of these are only dependencies. All you have to do is add the dependency to the project. And what is pretty good though, <coughs> the, the, the magic behind the scenes is really just checking if certain dependencies are present in the class path. And if those dependencies are present, then it enables additional uh, spring components and or spring beans to be used by your application. Simply, if you have the Spring Data uh, Starter, you can write uh, you, you can write repositories with just you know writing an interface and and, and, and that's it. That's basically the work that you can do. Uh, it has a very extensive uh, runtime statistics module called Actuator. Uh, many of the same statistics that you will normally get through AMX based on your application. Requests per second, uh, memory, etc., etc., etc. They have uh, JSON-based REST services that you can use to, to gather that information for metrics and management. You know, if, if you deploy this in a in a bigger enterprise setting. And uh, externalized configuration. Uh, again, you can override all of these. Uh, uh, configuration points either on a simple and plain text file or you can have different configurations for different environments. Uh, for example, if you add 
JPA starter modules and you add an embedded database, let's say H2 or Derby, for example, if you don't define a data source explicitly, it will automatically create create an on-memory database and it's going to set up a data, a data source called data source by default. And you're going to be able to use that. You can override that and use a data source inside um, an application server like WebLogic, etc. Or you can override it with, you know, you, I mean, you can write the complete URL, the JDBC driver, etc., etc., etc. I mean, it is it's not going to use always the embedded database. It's going to use whatever you tell it to do. For development purposes, for starting something where you can try things, it's it's very very handy. Embedded routing time. That was when we were working with this. This was really really neat. Uh, there are some certain target builds that you can do. I mean, you can create just a jar file that is just a library. You can create a, a jar file that is just an executable file. But if you create web applications, you can create a Word file that is also an executable jar. But what, they, what you do is you can embed Tomcat or Jetty inside your Word file and execute it just as another application. Well, just as an old jar. Uh, that is very useful when you are developing your application because you couldn't start the application in, in the book mode, for the study in, in Eclipse, and you are basically debugging inside the container. Which, yeah, okay. Unit testing can take you so far, integration testing helps a lot. But there are times when you need to figure out what's going on, what's going on inside it gives you a very, very, very easy way to do that. Microservices. This is quite a, a small toolkit or a, a toolkit that helps helps to develop where we quick and dirty services. It's also very helpful. I mean, apart from the all the enterprise uh, support that it has for different libraries, this is also true. There are sensors everywhere now. Uh, your health bands, if you, you have your Fitbit or uh, Jam Up, or I don't remember what the other one go. Your mobile phones, as everyone knows, you know, it's always gathering <coughs> information about you and about everything you do and everything you see. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that, that information can be useful for good and bad purposes, of course. but that information is not going to be useful, or it's just data only, only until it's gathered by another service and then summarized probably in a, in a big data uh, toolkit. You can, have, you can also have very small servers. You don't need to have you know, a traditional, you know, I don't know, four processors, 16 cores, server with uh, gigs and gigs of RAM. You could have a Raspberry Pi. Arduino is probably not yet, or, or it's not really a platform for running Spring Boot, but it can be a platform for, for sensing information or for delivering control information to, to other to our service. Uh, you know, for example, in BBI, the medium voltage, uh, we gather information from from your electric meter at home. The, we got information on the field in real time and, and use it to optimize the voltage on the electrical grid. And that provides savings not only for you, it provides savings also for the, for the utility because they have to, to buy or they have to uh, distribute less energy to, to the final consumers. So, so those are all sensing uh, processes. And this obviously gets better processed and analyzed and turned from data into information and into actionable information, you know, using other big data. I mean, or mixing with social, social media or uh, using other historical databases. <coughs> uh, this is in contrast to 
application servers, um, they have a place, and uh, I can certainly think that a, a bigger company that has the resources to work with them, they will want the support, they want the security, they want the, the having a company, having a name behind it where they need support. But for many of these use cases, uh, it just doesn't work. I mean, I'm taking, for example, the licensing of WebLogic, Westphere, and I don't know who else because you know almost everyone else is free. <laughs> you, you don't really have to pay licenses for many of them, and they become a jack of all trades. I mean, you even the JEE six has the concept of the web profile. It's still a very broad profile to be working with. Normally, you have all the services there: uh, data sources, JNDI, uh, servlets, uh, I don't know, messaging queues, etc., etc., etc. And for many of these applications, that's just too much. You don't need all of that capacity for many of the applications that microservices are targeted for. And then they are monolithic, they, they become resource hogs. Uh, very, very easy with just memory use, uh, number of servers, there comes a time with, I mean, they have very good clustering support for a reason, and the reason is that you will need it whenever you get to a certain point. Uh, and this comes from the programming model that was based upon uh, on J EJBs in, in the beginning, having I mean, state full services. Uh, it just doesn't scale to, you know, to, to big, big, big numbers. It just doesn't work. Uh, there is some work already, or there, well, there, there is something working already. With GI, it's, uh, you know, modular, mo Java modular framework that keeps us a relief from, from a jar hell, where you can have, I don't know, one application uses a, a, a version of log4j, and then you want to write, you want to integrate another application that uses an older version, and class path is the same, but you doesn't work. Uh, OS, OSGI and Jigsaw, which is coming in Java 9, was supposed to be out in Java 8, but they wanted to have more, work, more time to work with it. it. It lets you have a more fine-grade control on the class file and on the class loader that you're going to be using for your application. You can do things like swapping versions of your, of your modules on the fly while the application is still running, etc., etc. So it's getting there. Even, I mean, that functionality is already in some of these application servers. I mean, WebLogic behind the scenes, it's an OSGI, con OSGI container. It's just that they didn't expose that, inf that to the developers or to the users until, until the, one of the latest versions of, of WebLogic, for example. Glassfish was already migrated to <coughs> that as well. And this is the part when I said, well, we, we've heard this before. I mean, we've heard these services. We've heard about SOA. Uh, and we, also, we always had the same concerns about security, service repository, and, and service discovery transaction management across uh, servers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've been there. We've done it before. Uh, so what happens now that we have a, a bunch of small applications that are running on their own server and that we want to work with? And then again, this model of very small modules works very well with uh, platform as a service <coughs> containers. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking just not just you know virtual servers, but also small containers like Docker, etc., et et that can help you. You know, I need twenty more instances of this application because I'm having a few. That's all. Um, so that was Corva a long time ago. So I still I did work with it, and they gave me a few nightmares. <laughs> Web services. Uh, 
uh, they began very quick, very clean. They said, well, it's XML, it's text, we can send it. And then we said, well, we need to have security. We need to sign the messages. We need to have web services transactions. We need to have reliable messaging, blah, 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 blah. It became so complex that we began to look for own solutions because it became too difficult to get something done. And what happened with REST? Uh, there are new services coming out. I mean, I, I was saying, for example, that Spotify, they were using the DNS system that they had in the company. There is a SRV or server record in DNS that is not used very often or that is not commonly used by many companies. And it's supposed to be used as a service registry. So, it helped them to scale up to a certain point, and now they are moving to Apache Zookeeper, who is, and that is the, the service management engine that you can use, for example, in, in Hadoop, you know, to, to coordinate, uh, making sure that, you know, if, if server goes down, you can start another five, et cetera, et cetera. Hadoop doesn't do that by itself, you need to have, an, you know, another service doing the oversight making sure that you are still running. Netflix has also another open source uh, project called Eureka. Uh, and Netflix is you know, open sourcing a lot of tools that they are doing for, uh, or that they are using in, in Amazon Web Services. Uh, one of the tools that they have is, uh, <coughs> many of them have names related to monkeys or gorillas, etc. Uh, so one of them is crashing servers at random and try to ensure that their applications are still up and running even after they are killing everyone, everyone else. And Eureka is their service repository. So there are tools coming out already or that are there today to, to try and provide the same uh, uh, wide level services that we have in other environments. So, yes, it may not be there today. It has probably a specific niche where you need a smaller applications or smaller uh, uh, deployments or just the smaller containers, as I said, Docker. But what is going to get? It's going to get there. We're going to be able to find those tools in the future. So I, have a, I have a question. Yes. yes. So, what about tools like uh, API gateways, for instance, like RPG mastery? Do they solve some of these problems? They solve some of those problems. They are basically API mashups in, in a way. Uh, we were previously doing all the all the mashing up in <coughs> in our application in probably JavaScript code, right, at, at the client. And many of these services, what they are doing is they are providing that service for you, and you can only you can you know create a mashup service and that service is going to take care of contacting you know five six services on the on the back end. That, that that that's a possible solution for that. Uh, but then again it, it really depends if you have access to deploy the services on a on, on the open internet even if you have you know a specific uh, zone in your uh, Platform as a service or in your service deployments, uh, some some of the services are not there yet. I'm talking more about transaction coordination. Uh, is is not a very strong. Uh, it's not very strong at, at that moment. I mean, if one API fails, you're going to have to call all the other APIs back. I mean, but it's one one application or that this mashup service that you're writing, who is doing the the different calls at a time. I'm talking more about saying, okay, we are all in a transaction that's work. If anyone fails, automatically let's let's get out of there alive. So that's going to be there in the future, but not there yet. Um, okay, uh, I was ready to go for a small demo. Uh, I mean, many of the so how it works, we're going to see it here, but I don't know, so far, any questions, any other comments? Uh, okay, first question, a question for you guys. Uh, 
who is using Spring Boot already? Who has been thinking about it? Okay. okay. It's about the person that I knew that were using it. <laughs> um, we started to use it in, I don't know if it was probably March, I mean, right after the Spring Boot was, uh, you know, released, probably five days after it was released. It was, and it was sheer coincidence. We started to look for, for tools for a new framework to, to migrate or to create a new application that we were developing. Because the, the previous service framework that we had was not very robust. We were still finding, finding it out sometimes. Um, and the Spring Boot seemed to, to fit the question. Back then, we, we had to go step by step. I uh, mean, there are other projects right now, like uh, Yay Hipster, for example. Yay Hipster is a project that combines Spring Boot with AngularJS, which is exactly what we're using Spring Boot and AngularJS. Uh, but, and we began using Gradle for dependency management, and we used Spring Boot and AngularJS to create the application. And then we went back and integrated Gradle, no, oh, sorry, Grunt into the, into the picture to coordinate the JavaScript part. And it turns out that, that now JHipster does all that for you. So we, had we had that project out there probably in March, we will be using it already. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there are projects coming out that that are based on the Spring Boot. I, I think at this moment it's more uh, under the scenes or behind the scenes, people are bringing it into their projects or bringing it into new deployments, and that's what we're running. Are you taking those apps to production? Yes. You are. Or do you uh, use the embedded containers in production, or do you go to work? Mm, no, we use Tomcat in this case. But we could have used the embedded server, but the way that we are deploying or delivering the applications is, is pretty well defined. There are two servers in different security zones, and certain services are accessible from one place, and other services are accessible from you know, another place. So that is already pretty well defined. However, the, the, the embedded service has been very useful during testing, during development, that has been a, a, a great help. And this application that we uh, created using the Spring Boot in Angular JS is more of a reporting application, more of a dashboard kind. So it could very well be placed outside the main containers or the main uh, environments that we normally deploy them, and it could work very well using the standalone engine. Okay, so if you have to upgrade uh, Angular JS uh, mm -hmm. in the latest version, it support that? Yeah. Well, the Spring Boot doesn't directly embed AngularJS. In projects like Yet Hipster do. I mean, they they already have a recipe that gives you a project. It's it's kind of a templating engine again, but they, it gives you a already made project with the Spring Boot and AngularJS tied up in a way that you can start adding more REST services. They give you a a template that you can follow and go on to that. Uh, the way we work with the application, actually, we we work separately. I mean, we were we were doing the REST services on one side, the Angular JS uh, UI on on another part, and yeah, there were some integration hiccups at the end. But you know, in the end, it's all REST and JSON. So. If you use Android JS, if you use React JS, if you want to be, uh, you know, if you want to suffer and you want to use plain Tom, uh, you you can. I mean, in, in this is not going to provide you with a. I guess you can run. Well, at least in Java, there is now a, a decent enough Java screen engine that could potentially run a node, but I don't think anybody will do that. So it's. Really, is on on the server side or on the application side. It's it's all Java. So your interaction with Angular JS, if you're migrating from 
one two or one three on then later on to two out. As long as you keep talking the same language, the same services, it, it's gonna work. There is no migration path per se. I mean, that will be the migration path of Angular and JS on any other service that you work with. Okay. Um, anyone else? I have a question about the. Uh, you talked about the embedded runtime. For yes. The world. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you said it's useful in development. Uh, yeah. Have you used it in production or in other? In testing, but not in production. That's my question, man. Oh, right. That's <laughs> because we work together. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in the way it's, in the end, it's embedding Tomcat. So I guess the question is, will you use Tomcat or will you use JD in production? I don't know. Depends on how comfortable you are with that. So if you're embedding the web server in the jar file, mm -hmm. um, during development, let's say you change a class and you just change a string in there, right? Mm -hmm. How do those updates get reflected? Do you have to like, generate a war again and then? Yeah, the I mean you you run your build process again through okay. Gradle or Maven again, and you you get the new the notification. Okay. When you are working in inside your IDE, for example, you already have all the dependencies in your class path in in your. I don't know, Spring or NetBeats project, that is already there. Mm -hmm. So if you run the application, I will say basically, if it compiles it, it's going to run. All right. That, 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 that's basically it. Yeah, you can actually use like JRevel or something to get a like, ah, live that, refresh. Um, that yeah, think. it also works. <laughs> so it uh, like on the fly changes. Yeah. Yeah, that also works very well. JRevel, I haven't had the honor yet. Uh, yeah, there, there are. You can you can do things on the fly. I mean, even with plain Java, you can do a little bit of changes on the fly. If you are in the book mode, you can change. I think at the method level, you can still write things and test them. But if you want to do that kind of live change, I would say use JRevel or another tool, tool that enables you to do that. Or there's another option. Uh, and we will see that in a moment. Uh, you can use Groovy for all of your services, or for all of your code, actually. So in that sense, using Groovy, yes, during production, I'm pretty sure that you want to compile Groovy to, to a jar of class files. But during development, you just write your, you know, write your change, save, and run it again. I mean, you don't have to go through the process of rebuilding the WAR file again. And again, during development, we'll, we'll see it in a moment. I mean, you don't have to rebuild during development. Only when you deploy to testing, et cetera, that, that's really when you have to rebuild your project to deploy it. Okay. Uh, let's see what happens. Every demo is always an experience. Yeah. First, let me see if I can bring this. It's small enough to move to the other thing. Okay. Okay. I'm a little bit blind here, so let's see what happens. Uh, I have a project that I created already before coming here. I mean, I, we can do one here, but uh, let me let me open this a little bit. I think it's the, the font is clear now. People on the back, is it clear? Great. Um, you know, if, if you haven't seen Gradle before, well, this is Gradle. Uh, Gradle, everyone. <laughs> you know, compared to uh, to Maven, I find uh, Gradle to be much much more concise, less verbose. You can very very easily invoke and uh, tasks from Gradle. In Maven, you can, but it, you have to jump through hoops to to, to do it, etc. So it's it's very basic. So. What do you need? 
they have a, a dependency that you need to use in, in Gradle so that you have certain packages or certain classes available while you are making the build. That's what this uh, build, script, build script dependency is all about. You can use the Maven repositories, no problem there. <coughs> and uh, in, in Gradle, you use different plugins and here and say, well, you, you can, in Gradle, you're going to be doing a Java application. You can create the, an Eclipse project and set of files, etc. Idea for if you use that ID, you're going to be using Spring Boot and you're going to create a WAR file. That's it. Here you are making a configuration of the WAR plugin. You're saying, well, the base, the base name of the application is demo version 0001, etc. The repositories for the rest of the dependencies, not the build dependencies, but um, not the dependencies for this plugin, but the dependencies for your for Writing your application, you, you can set it up here. Obviously, you can set up other Maven repositories if you have Artifactory <coughs> or Archiva, any other Artifact repository inside your company, or only, you know, even only as a proxy server. You know, it, it's, it takes a lot of time to download all of those, all of those jars. Um, Configuration by the Tron time. I'll, I'll explain what this is in a moment. Okay, these are the dependencies. These are just plain Maven repository references. We're using the Spring Boot and we're using the Spring Boot Starter Web. And that's going to bring um, REST services, it's going to bring Support for uh, REST, support for MVC, support for servlets, etc., etc., etc. You can start writing MVC controllers in Spring all by adding that dependency. That you know has a has many other dependencies behind the scenes. You can you can see the the POM XML if you want to see what that's going to be. Brought in, or you can see it in the wire file because in, in the end all of those jars have to be embedded some way, some way in, the, in, in the wire file if it's going to be a, a standalone application. Um, <coughs> I'm bringing also uh, Jackson for uh, JSON. Uh, what's going to happen is the the Spring Boot the Spring Boot the, the starter web it's going to see if it has as to Jackson, then you can uh, receive or send uh, JSON objects derived from your plain Java themes. You don't have to convert them into I mean, from Java to JSON and vice versa. That is going to be done for you. Uh, I commented out of Twitter how this is what I talked about statistics, how to do what I did later. And this is the other file. And we're saying, okay, we're going to provide room time. We're going to provide contact. I could change this to Jenny, and it will work. And uh, that's, that's basically it. That's all you need to bring all the dependencies in your application for, 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 making, for making that. There are, again, Spring Boot starters for JPA, Spring Boot starters for uh, MongoDB, Spring Boot starters for JMS, etc., etc., etc. So uh, I'll, I'll show you later on the, the other modules that are available, and, and that's all. That's all you have to do. The main uh, Spring Boot starter or the core Spring Boot was going to be doing. It's just, it's going to check if for every component that is registered in Spring, uh, it's going to check if it has the necessary dependencies in the class path. And if those dependencies are there, it's going to enable those services. On that, on that first dependency, there's no version. Does that always mean that you're getting oh. the latest? In this case, I'm setting up the version up here. Oh, okay. Since you're setting this version on this build script <laughs> dependency, then 
you use the same version in all the other spring Boot components. Um, test compile, well, th this has to do with Gradle and basically saying, well, these are the dependencies for compiling your application. This is a provided runtime for the application. This, I'm not, you're not going to be using uh, these dependencies for building, only for running the application. And for compiling your test, there's also a boot starter that basically has a unit and a, a few other project, projects. I, I don't remember them all. In this case, for creating the Eclipse uh, project, it's going to add some things. I mean, removing the GRE container from the class path and adding, uh, <coughs> I've already told you, the, the, the bug uh, runtime. This, that's not really necessary. It's just, it just creates a cleaner uh, Eclipse project. Uh, trust me that, I mean, we didn't use that when we started and it's still working. So it's not really required. <coughs> and uh, this wrapper, this is all a, a Gradle only thing. Basically, you, if you don't have Gradle installed in your system, you can distribute a, a small, well, relatively small, uh, uh, Gradle bootstrap project, and it can download uh, Gradle from the web, and it chooses to build, is that to build your applications. You, so you don't need to have Gradle installed everywhere. <coughs> Now, how did I come up with this? When we started our project, we, we did all of this by hand. <laughs> we created the Gradle, we created the, the main structure, source main Java, source main resources, etc., 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 and then we placed whatever we had to add over there. Uh, let me see if I can show you all the other properties. This, this property, so let me go to that. Um, okay, here we go. These are all the configuration properties that are included in Spring Boot by default. Obviously, you need to add different starter dependencies to have some of them available, but again, you have different profiles for getting different configuration settings, uh, the login configuration, the identity, the embedded server configuration, you can change the port, you can, uh, you can set up SSL, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, use only certain headers, et cetera. Spring MVC, JSON preprint, the view prefixes for MVC. Uh, you can use Pineleaf, FreeMaker, you can use uh, Ruby templates, Velocity templates. Uh, for security, this is what I told you. Normally, you set up a single username and password. And what's more, the password is normally in, in plain text. Uh, but these kind of properties, you can set them up here. If you don't want to use the, the setting that it's auto-configured by default, by boot, you can write it in, do, in that application.properties uh, file, and it's going to be picked up by Spring Boot from the beginning. It's going to 
it's going to go through several steps. It's going to check that application dot properties. Then it's going to check uh, uh, JVM parameters. You know, mi minus D something something parameters that you add to the to the JVM. Then it's going to check environment variables. And uh, in, in any of those places, you can change this configuration. And the one that is most external to your application is the one that has high priority. Um, data sources, I was mentioning this as well. Uh, actually, this normally it embeds the Tomcat JDBC uh, that is cool. MongoDB, JPA, Solar, Elasticsafe, Elasticsearch, Liquidbase, JMX. Rabbit for messaging Redis, ActiveMQ, Hornet, Q, etc., etc., etc. All all the projects for the Spring Social, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, and specific views for mobile, and these are some of the other properties that are used in Actuator. We'll I'll show you that in a moment. Um, you can embed a remote shell, you can use SSH or Ethernet to connect you to your application and then run commands as well. You can uh, start up or bring down certain components or certain services inside the application externally once it's running. So that, that is useful in, in, in the microservices context. Um, anyway, and all of these are configuring in very specific classes. So what you have to do, for example, in data source auto configuration, if I look at the code, this is the kind of thing it's going to say. Okay, this configuration is going to be enabled if this class is in your class. Then it is going to be using or trying to configure everything that is inside here. So that was just a preview on how is this actually done behind the scenes. Most of the time, you 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 can get away with just uh, either changing configuration parameters, or sometimes you can substitute their already configured resource. For example. In the data sources that they provide, if you want to place the password in the data source, the password is you know text, just plain text. If you want to encrypt the password, you need to override the data source component to to decrypt the password that you can write there. So this, that, that's also another option. Okay. Going back to Spring. This is it. This is the this is the start of your application. Here are a few annotations. This is uh, an annotation from from Spring where they began moving their configuration from XML to Java config. That's just saying that this class provides configuration for Spring. Then component scan and enable our configuration. It's going to you know, check the, the entire class path from wherever this class is and forward. And it's going to look for components in, in all of those packages to look for, for your controllers, uh, data repositories, etc., etc. You can obviously overwrite, I mean, change some of these, for example, in the, the component scan. Uh, you can target a specific path, for example, instead of just your whatever is from the bit, from the root of that package and going forward. You can change that. And the only thing you do is you have a main uh, method. You just call the Spring application run with certain arguments. That's it. That's what makes it very convenient and very easy to work with uh, the Spring Boot in, in development. Uh, the other, Component here that 
That will normally work just for starting, for making a jar file that is executable, that's, that's all you will need. For making an executable WAV file, all you need is this service initializer, which it's a component that is going to be found by uh, our configuration in, in the application class. And that's all it's going to do. This, this is Spring, the Spring Boot server, Servlet Initializer. It's based on uh, Servlet 3.0. And we don't need to have a WebXML anymore in the web application. I mean, we, you can configure everything through Java annotations. And, and that class that is being ex, uh, extended uh, provides for that. It registers as a, as a listener in, your, in the web XML. And as, as you normally used to start your application context that you had a listener, and that listener was loading your different uh, context, application context XML files. That's what you're <coughs> going to be doing with this uh, server initializer. What this is going to do is basically going to call your application class. And then <coughs> this is going to do the rest of the uh, auto configuration. Um, two very simple services. I'm creating this, this as a very small controller. This enable auto configuration basically makes it uh, a candidate for being auto configured by Spring Boot. That's, that's all it's going to be doing. And for the rest, it's basically just a, 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 just a, 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 a Spring MVC controller. In this case, I'm going to be hearing it. This is going to be hearing on, or listening on the hello path, just returning a simple uh, hello world. This is it. That's all you have to do. A slightly more complex example is having a this hello name last name pat receiving those as uh, parameters to, to this method creating a, a small object that you just set those properties and return this uh, you return this object as you see we are not making a conversion to JSON that is going to be done on the fly but let me just run this very quickly. as Spring Boot application. And here's where I would wish we had a smaller font. So here's when I show OK. These are all the, I'm going to have a, I'm mapping a hello path, a hello <coughs> last name path. And also, Info, DOM, auto configuration, environment, config, etc., etc., etc. Let me show you this from a um, small REST client. Let me connect here. always. Okay, doesn't have anything mapped here. Also worked. Yes, sir. That's it. Obviously, and my co worker, Rijon, can be a, uh, testify. He, he can get much more complex than this, but, but this is it. That's all you need to do. That's it. Uh, any questions? Two. One, um, one and two. Uh, first one, could you go back to your code real quick? I think you said like uh, you have an annotation called enable auto configuration on your uh, 
Apollo resource. Yeah. And so I was just curious, um, <coughs> as part of that, you know, I know you use Jackson as your like uh, JSON serializer. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, is that just that's set up automatically then with that auto configure? Exactly. That's what's kind of, that's what's happening. And so if you want to configure Jackson or Jackson to like you know let's do pretty printing or like you know you, convert you can, to print in a certain way. Yeah, you you can do additional configuration here on the on the controller, or for example, if you want to do pretty printing, I'm pretty sure that there was a. Okay, there would be a configuration uh, I, I, here. There was a config for that. I don't remember what that, what that was. The, gotcha. Okay. I'm pretty sure that that's there was one. And then I had one more question that kind of had to do with this page. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's supposed to be like lightweight, but it looked like in there there was about 4,000 configuration things. Oh, um, yeah. And so I was just curious, like, I know right now in your Gradle file you only like, include a few dependencies. And yeah, I, I, I think I didn't make a rebuild after removing the, uh, how do you call it, after removing the actuator. I will need to see if I can do it really quickly. So I guess I was yeah. saying that you're only using a few of the yeah. you know, pieces of that framework. So obviously all those configuration things, there you can't do all of them unless you put in more dependencies. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And so one thing I was curious about too is so in that like um, piece of GitHub code that you went over to, you had like a conditional if class uh, annotation. I think if you go back to yeah. that browser, if you hit forward, it's still in the let's see in the last tab you have open on the right, and you click forward on the web browser. Yeah, fit in here. So you had oh. like uh, conditional on class and had a special class type. Yeah, I was just curious, what is that? Annotation from is that something you can use normally? No, like no, no, it's it's an annotation that it's this is added by is well it's partially by is by Spring 4.0, okay. but that particular the condition on a class it's is used by Spring Boot to to enable all this uh, <coughs> out of configuration or self discovery of this configuration. But okay. this condition on a class comes from Spring 4. Okay. So yeah, Spring Boot depends on or relies on Spring Four to work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next. We had a little change of plan on where we're going to get drinking after this. <laughs> um, we we tend to battle for space over at Tez, so we're going to show up at uh, the tavern. Anybody knows where the Exxon is on Patterson and Three Top? There's a little teeny shopping center right behind that Exxon, and that's where we'll be at the tavern. Um, we're going to have a drawing now. Uh, Roman, do you have anything, or, or is it just signature or not? Okay. I get to pick up. All right, so first off, did anybody not get a raffle ticket? Thank <laughs> you.